Thank you. Um, so the topic of the presentation is lions and tigers and bears, oh ouch. And I wanted to talk about wild animal bites. Um, so we're going to go into some fun trivia. Then we'll look at the incidence of animal bites worldwide at some point in the presentation. We'll discuss certain animal bites and their microbiology of their bites. Uh, treatment and prevention of the animal bites for each of the ones that I have covered. And then conclusion statements, okay? Um, so according to Reader's Digest, which animals do you think have the top 12 most deadliest bites? Hippo, yeah. Hippo? okay. We have had one of those here at TGH. A crocodile. Shark. Um, this is more land animal. Insects count. Uh, there is a family of felines, yes. Um, spiders on there, mosquitoes on there. Spiders are the most deadliest? According to Reader's Digest. There's multiple sources that have different. Um, flies? Uh, flies are one of them as well. So um, these are landborn. These are landborn animals. So cats in all shapes of the feline form. Uh, monkeys. Uh, cro crocodiles are on the next slide. We have hyenas are considered one of the most deadliest. Um, I put up they're the Buffy Vampire Slayer, but humans were considered one of the most deadliest, according mm -hmm. to um, Reader's Digest. Uh, and snakes were on the top 12 as well. Um, we have crocodiles and alligators, hippos, mosquitoes, um, and they have uh, certain types of flies, for example, the tsetse fly, ticks, and, and spiders. Most notably, this black Brazilian spider, um, which rounds out the top 12, according to Reader's Digest. Um, other sources included animals that have deadly bites, including lions and tigers and bears, gorillas and jaguars. And they're referencing their um, scale of the deadliest bites based on PSI, which is pounds per square inch, which is a force of the bite. All right. So... Now, some did you know facts. Did you know that as high as 80% of cat bites can become infected? According to the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, there's over 700 types of bacteria that live in our tongues and in between our teeth. Monkey bites can transmit rabies and simian herpes. According to the World Journal of Emergency Surgery, hyenas attack the face, neck, and cervical spine of their victims, like most cats. Um, snakes are responsible for 23 deaths that were reported in Australia between the years of 2008 and 2017 that were done by animals, and we'll look at a chart later in the presentation. And king cobras can kill up to 20 people with two-tenths of the fluid ounce of their venom. Some more did you know facts. According to the Smithsonian Magazine, African hippos are regarded as the continent's most dangerous animal. These hippos have a bite that has a force of 2,000 psi, which is pounds per square inch again. Alligators can crack a turtle's hard shell. Crocodiles, um, they actually take the cake. There is actually a Nile crocodile that has over 5,000 psi um, bite force. And the closest second was a saltwater crocodile that is 3,700 psi. So, According to the World Health Organization, um, the incidence of animal bites. So which animal bites do you think have the top three highest incidence worldwide? And I think this is just bites. So actually you have a clue. Those three. It's dogs and cats and snakes. So. Um, according to the World Health Organization, up to 5 million people are bitten by snakes every year. And estimates um, report that up to 4.5 million people are bitten by dogs every year worldwide. There are studies in India, and two of which were most notable in, um, by the World Health Organization, that monkeys um, are the third most common animal bite after snakes and dogs in that country. Um, but overall, worldwide, cats are the third most common animal bite. Um, both children and adult, adults are most at risk, and persons who live in resource-poor areas, rural countries where there's limited access to medical care are the ones that suffer the most when they encounter these animal bites. 
All right, so moving into, can anybody tell me who this team is? Lions, Lions and Jaguars. <laughs> or I'm sorry, and pa the Panthers and the Jaguars. Sorry, Mindy. Um, black Panthers. No, black. Panthers with black spots. <laughs> so um, this is actually a picture that was taken from the local newspaper. And according to the newspaper, it wrote, that the, according to the owner of the circus, a lion became excited by the noise of the audience and during the show it escaped from his unlocked cage and attacked an eight-year-old boy. The victim was dragged 20 feet away. The boy was attacked by a four-year-old lion called Bang Bang and the lion was about 200 kilograms. The patient was sent to a rural hospital, which was about five hours away, and then transferred to another uh, facility which was able to provide further care that was also another additional five hours away. The, bo the boy had multiple extensive wounds including of the head and neck and chest and abdomen um, and ultimately this uh, boy died. So cat bites in general, worldwide domestic cats account for 2 to 50 percent of the injuries related to animal bites. In the U.S. there is an estimated 400,000 domestic cat bites and of those, 66,000 visits to the ER every year. Uh, women have the highest rate of animal bites. I don't know if they're trying to indicate that we are cat ladies, but um, treatment depends on the location of the bite, whether the cat was has their rabies vaccination at the, um, and uh, as a side note, in terms of prevention, if you vaccinate your cat, you have, um, it is recommended so that you don't transmit rabies with any kind of bites. Um, early treatment includes wound cleansing, prophylactic antibiotics to decrease the risk of infection, rabies post-exposure treatment depending on the animal's vaccination status, and administration of the tetanus vaccine if the person has not been adequately vaccinated in the past. So, so um, moving on to large cat bites. Large cat bites are uncommon worldwide, but most of the cases are seen in Asia and Africa. Um, in the U.S., the large cat bites are usually seen in um, zoo keepers or zoo handlers or zoo um, personnel um, or persons who actually own big cats. Um, usually those uh, bites are unprovoked, and in Asia and Africa, they're usually in the rural areas. And what has been reported is that they are seeing this happen more and more because humans are infiltrating where their habitats are. So the less land they have, the more, uh, more occurrence or incidence that they're going to run into people. Um, in general, most, cat, most cases of large cat bites have severe head and neck lacerations um, along with puncture wounds. And in the the organism that has been seen most commonly in large cat bites is pal Pasturella multicida. Um, and this has been reported in multiple um, case reports by humans who have been in, uh, bitten by large cat bites, including tigers and lions and bears and leopards and cougars. So a couple of the case encounters, if you see, look at the top pictures, um, that was a um, a Meridian girl, she was three years old and she was attacked by a jaguar. Um, she presented to a local emergency room in the country of Guyana. And um, she actually, what, that picture where she has the lacerations was actually in the operating room. Um, she required multiple surgeries and required several rounds of antibiotics. Um, but ultimately, she, that was her last surgery and look how happy she is, even though she's endured such um, terror. Um, the, according to Justin Hoffman, there has been 25 known f uh, fatal mountain lion attacks in North America. Um, the first documented case was actually in 1890. And if you look at his report, um, children were the most prone victims, usually those under the age of 10. And there were actually 10 deaths in those 25 that were of young children. What he actually noted based on review of the autopsy reports was that um, children who um, fit this young weight, usually about 24 kilos, 
and their head size was anywhere between 18 and 20 centimeters. Those were the size of a capybara, um, which is what these lions and large cats like to feed off of. So making a, maybe a poor correlation that children have the same kind of body weight, body type, uh, head circumference that would um, predispose them to having um, these attacks more often. Um, in terms of the lion um, and, the, and the Bengal tiger, uh, there was another case report that both of these cats had um, bites that were resulted in pasturella infections. Um, one of them was actually um, bitten on the, on the skull and caused a purulent meningitis, and the Bengal tiger actually um, bit the patient, bit the person on the shoulder, very close to the neck vessels, and caused a pur purulent arth septic arthritis. So now down to the nitty gritty of what we will look at potentially and what we would be asked of um, as ID uh, physicians is these were the most common um, bacterial um, agents, both aerobic and anaerobic, um, according to the study that looked at 57 um, infected cat bites. And by an overwhelming um, incidence was Pasteurella followed by our strep and staph species, Moroxella less commonly, um, and then our anaerobic, which would be our Fusobacterium, our por Porphyromonas, and Pacteroides. Um, any questions about these in particular? Okay, now we're moving on. So, can anybody tell me who this team is? The Bears. The Bears. So, the Chicago Bears. Okay, so we're going to move into bear bites. Um, so, this is a grizzly bear, and this was actually a very nice table published in uh, one of the Alaskan news stations where it um, is a comprehensive review of the bear attacks, both black bears and grizzly bears. Um, in Canada Ala and Alaska and the continental U.S. based on which breed of the bear caused the attack and at what year. Um, and if you actually go to the link, which I provided on the bottom of the slide, you can actually click on each of the um, triangles or the squares and you can actually find more details about each of the attacks. Of the 46 um, attacks that were listed in that um, diagram there, um, they were all fatal. Uh, black bears perpetrated about 25 of those attacks while brown bears were about 21. Uh, so far, um, the greatest number of attacks that occurred in any year was in 2005, if you can look at the tick marks, which that indicates how many attacks were there per year. And the year prior, there was actually zero attacks. Again, <laughs> suggesting that the more people are infiltrating the habitats of the bears, the more likelihood that you'll come encounter with one. And be, if you're encountering them in their times of feeding, you're likely or at a predisposition to be some part of their food. Um, okay, so what do we tell patients? Um, according to the National Park Service um, website, um, they recommend that we be alert, we don't hike alone, we don't hike during the night or dusk or dawn areas, always carry bear spray, which is pepper spray for bears, um, and know how to use it. And <laughs> throw it at the can. That's a way, that's a way to do it. Uh, stay on the maintained trails and avoid carcasses because those are another areas for feeding. Um, so those are just some pictures that they have put up. Um, around the for patients or pe persons to be alert of. So what do you do if you do encounter a bear? So actually, <laughs> um, interestingly enough, in Europe, they were actually putting muzzles on bears and covering their claws or declawing them. And they were having actual boxing events with the human and the bear. And somehow it got into the US in the early 1900s and 
because of an attack that killed one of the boxers, it kind of laid down low and is, was part of like the underground boxing arena. And it resurfaced back in 1930. And this is an actual picture of Gus Waldrof, um, which um, he is seen fighting a bear. And you can see that the bear has a muscle and has um, some kind of device on its claw, front claws that don't allow it to scratch the boxer, but you can see that they still have the claws on the bottom feet. So, um, according to the Alaska Wildlife um, Association, in the real world, if you were to if I, uh, encounter yourself with a bear, you either play dead or you fight back. Um, if the bear acts defensive, especially brown bears, they recommend that you play dead. Um, so that means just falling to the ground and holding your breath for as long as you can until the bear goes away. Um, if the bear, uh, and if the bear perceives you as a human, as food, then it recommends to fight back. Um, exactly. There is actually... <laughs> They actually don't recommend that you run away from the bear because it senses that it's a fleeing animal. It's more likely to chase you um, and it's more likely to think that you're food. So they recommend not running away. Um, <laughs> they also recommend that um, in some of the cases back in that other diagram that if you shoot the bear or kill the bear for whatever reason, that you notify the Alaskan wild wildlife troopers so they can remove the carcass off of the trail or around the trail so that other persons don't aren't at an increased risk of encountering a bear if they're looking for the carcasses or looking for food. Um, okay, and this is actually an account from a um, case report that it was a 49-year-old hunter. He was attacked by a grizzly bear while he was hunting elk in the Canadian Rocky Mountains. Um, and he, the attack actually took place at the foothills of east, uh, east of the Banff National Park in Alberta, Canada, um, within the grizzly bear range, uh, which is a narrow strip between the Continental Divide and the prairies in Canada. He suffered multiple injuries of the scalp and shoulders. Um, he remembered the, that the bear bit him on the skull. Um, he was able to kill the bear, um, and they noted that he had teeth marks uh, when he arrived to the medical facility on his cranium. He had cultures from the scalp at the time of the surgery, which was about 12 hours after the injuries occurred. And those cultures grew serratia of multiple different uh, subspecies, Aramonas, Bacillus, and Enterococcus. So, interestingly enough, of the few case reports that they were able to collect uh, the cultures from either the person or the bear, um, the makeup was very similar to what had happened for this person in particular. Um, and when they were able to kill the bear and get the mouth flora, it was very similar to what the cultures grew out of the actual wound from the patient. Um, so knowing what kind of bacteria is in the bear's mouth could potentially help you if you're doing your ID rotation or are an ID physician up in an area where bear attacks and bear bites are common. Um, in Alberta, Canada, uh, for example, and from 1960 to 1998, there was 42 documented serious injuries. Um, and 69% of those were from grizzly bears. Um, but only 2.5 of the total bear population in Alberta, that's what they make up. So um, they're more of the aggressive uh, bear. So just keeping that in mind when you um, come across these types of patients. Um, so this is just another, uh, to, another article that looks at um, the makeup of comparing grizzly bear bacterial flora um, to a black bear in table one. Um, and then the second table also compares or looks at the patient data, the, what kind of bear, and then what kind of isolates were grown. So when you look at the staph epidermidis or the staph aureus out of the table two, um, they postulated that that was likely from the skin flora of the human that caused the wound. Um, because when they looked back 
at looking at the prior literature that they could find that most of the bacteria that were able to collect from the cultures of the wound and the cultures from the mouth were the same, but they did not include any kind of staph, uh, predominant staph species. Um, all right, so now we're moving into snakes. Um, so uh, this is just a um, bite, a sound bite from the World Health Organization that in 2018, um, 5.4 million people were estimated to be bitten by snakes. 100,000 people die each year as a result of a snake bite. And then again, 400,000 people are left disabled or disfigured from these injuries. Um, again, most of them were in Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, and interestingly enough, the Texas Health De Department of Health also tracks the snake bites for the U.S. Um, and they uh, count that there's 7,000 venomous snakes annually um, in the U.S. with a mortality rate of less than 1%. They postulate that it's likely due to the fact that of um, easier access to medical care, easier access to um, anti-venom. Um, but they didn't report um, how many bites there are per year from non-venomous snakes. Um, and then this is going back to the first comment that I um, made in for Australia between the eight, uh, years of 2008 and 2017. You can see that the snakes kind of fall, at least in this country, kind of like in the middle of the range where they account for about 23 um, of the 23 incidents of animal bites that resulted in death in Australia. Mo for them, it was mostly horses and cows that do any kind of animal transport, um, but snakes do fall in that top uh, portion of the deaths for that country. So moving on to the most deadliest snakes, there's very much of a debate as to which ones are more deadly, but I picked the three that I felt were the most scariest, at least to me. Um, <laughs> so uh, the inland taipan, so it's considered one of the deadliest snake bites due to its ability to have this type of toxin called typoxin. Um, it's a complex mix of neurotoxins, procoagulants, and myotoxins. Um, and it paralyzes muscle, muscles and inhibits your breathing and causes a DIC-like picture and it causes a destruction of the muscles, and it's actually endemic to Australia, so beware of when you travel to Australia. Um, the next one is King Cobra, which is the bottom picture here um, on your left of the screen. Um, it delivers um, a tremendous amount of paralysis-inducing neurotoxins, um, and it's venomous, venom is so strong and voluminous that can kill an elephant in actually a few hours. Um, and then this, that is, um, its distribution is worldwide. Um, some of them are more, um, their population is more prevalent in uh, certain countries, but it does have a worldwide distribution. Um, the saw, saw scaled viper. Um, it is maybe one of the deadliest snake bites um, since scientists think that um, some scientists think that it's believed to be responsible to more human deaths than all other snakes combined. Um, but they really didn't indicate as to why. I'm not sure if they think it um, it's doing it is caused this because people don't find it to be a venomous snake, but because it, it doesn't have a, the typical kind of like triangular or diamond-like um, head to it. Um, but it's usually found in dry regions of Africa, the Middle East, Pakistan, India, and Sri Lanka. Um, it does have this kind of sizzling warning sound um, where uh, certain sections of their bodies rub together and it causes like a sizzling sound, which is a warning to its uh, prey or any kind of other animals around there. Um, and that's the uh, right uh, picture to your right, or to your left, excuse me, and the king is to your left. So what do we need to know about snake bites and their infections? So um, there's a variety of different studies. Not all of them had the same 
snakes, but in general, um, some there are studies that looked at the bacterial flora of Chinese cobras, bamboo, bamboo pit vipers, uh, Malayan pit vipers, and they resulted that they have um, organisms such as coagulase negative staph, proteus species, Morganella, Aramonas, Enterococcus, and Clostridium. Uh, another study looked at uh, captive rattlesnakes, and their bacterial flora consisted of Pseudomonas, Proteus, again, Quag negative staph, Clostridium species, and Bacteroides. Um, I like the third point because it look, uh, hits on some of the um, snakes that we talked about just now, including the Indian cobra, the Russell viper, and the saw scaled viper, and the common crate. And those pathogens included Morganella, E. coli, Aramonas, Pseudomonas, and a variety of different others. Ultimately, um, gram-positive and gram-negative organisms should be covered when you are prescribing any antibiotics um, for patients who get uh, snake bites. Uh, you should also be thinking, is this an appropriate situation for an anti-venom um, that is appropriate to the actual country or, in, or uh, region? Uh, that would be for the snakes because not all anti-venom work um, for the same snake. Um, and um, what there was an, a study out of India that, con that uh, concluded that the oral cavity has a diverse um, array of bacteria, including gram-positive, gram-negative, and what they did in their study is that all of the gram negatives showed 100% susceptibility to imipenem levofloxacin, whereas the gram positive microorganisms had susceptibilities to azithromycin and augmentin. So, some antibiotics to think about, at least if you're in that area of the world or if you want to use that um, kind of source as your. Uh, point of contact or point of, re of um, information. So what do we tell patients? Um, we tell them to stay calm, seek medical attention immediately. Um, they recommend complete immobilization of the effective body part, um, primarily so that there isn't a, a rush of blood flow to or from that area that's affected. They don't recommend you the use of tourniquets or cutting the wounds because that can worsen the effects of the venom. Um, and uh, they also recommend um, that if the, if the snake is venomous or if there's a question that the snake could have been venomous using the anti-venom that isn't um, made for that region, avoiding tall grassy areas, wearing protective shoes or boots if possible, um, keeping the storage areas clean of rodents or any kind of rubbish, um, removing wood piles, or low brushes around the home as it can be um, reservoirs for the snakes. And if possible, raising your beds and using tuck neck mosquitoes so that um, you don't have the ability to have the snake kind of slither around in your bed. Um, they do note that um, they don't recommend that you capture a, ven a potentially venomous snake if you've been bit by the snake. Um, and then even dead snakes uh, should be handled with caution. Um, and the reason being is that their nervous system, even though the animal is killed, may still be active enough so that it can still bite you and give you another uh, venomous attack. Um, so ultimately, um, we should all inquire about which animal bite caused the injury, if possible getting the vaccine records for that animal, especially if it's any kind of domestic animal. Um, and knowing which organisms are associated with the bite. And there's also a good reference of the Journal of Clinical Microbiology that looks at the bacteriology of different types of animals, both domestic and uh, wild. So um, those are my references. Any questions?